you guys very much. Sure do appreciate you. We really do appreciate them. They always work double duty. They're over across the way and they do music for youth and then they head over here and then when I get ready to preach they leave. So I don't take that personally. I don't know what that's all about but you know, no, they're headed back over to youth, continuing to serve over there. Hey, it's good to see, uh, well we have uh, some missionaries uh, visiting with us. This almost looks like a missions conference. I'm looking around. I got, a, I got some more to introduce here. But the Murillos are here. Brother Murillo and his wife give us a big wave right over here. And uh, good to have them. Amen. And uh, I do know for sure, you know, you always test the missionaries. And yes, they did have some prayer cards. And so uh, that makes it a little bit easier for the preacher. But it's sure good to have you folks with us. And also, did you see Brother Ellison? Did you see who snuck in in the back over there? Look behind you there. Our own missionaries. The Mejias are with us in the back there. Good to have you guys. Amen. Amen. I'll tell you, you, you just can't get enough of us. Amen. So good to see you. And, uh, of course, we're thankful for them continuing to pray for uh, their ministry as uh, they make their way to uh, Turkey soon and very soon, our hope would be. Amen. And so uh, good to have you guys with us tonight. Let's do this. Let's turn in our Bibles to the Psalms. The Psalms. Remember when you first got saved and you wonder what those weird books were, Palms and Job? Remember that? Remember? <laughs> well, think about that for just a second and then I'll get back with you, okay? Psalm. Matter of fact, I was actually encouraging a fellow today. Uh, who had recently lost his wife and he, had, he didn't know anything about the scriptures. And I was explaining to him that the P was silent in Psalms and reading Psalm 46 to him. And uh, it's so wonderful just to watch the power of the word of God and in and, and the way God can work. Such a blessing. Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2. That's where we're going to be. And somebody might be thinking, well, you know, he, he preached from Psalm 1 last week, so what does that mean? Does that mean we're going to be here for like 150 weeks or something? Actually, it would be more than that, because I don't think I could get through, um, you know, some of the Psalms in just one, in one standing, amen? Some of these I can, but we're going to look at Psalm 2 tonight, Lord willing, for sure. Psalm chapter 2, let me read it. Psalm chapter 2, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. You know, you ought to read the Bible because we have a loving God, don't we? Aren't you thankful? Our God is good and what he does is good. But we also, we also serve and love a God of judgment, no doubt about it. Notice verse 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare and decree. The Lord has said unto thee, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun. 
That's an interesting verse, isn't it? Kiss the son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Now, I must tell you, just reading scripture ought to cause us to be stirred, no doubt about it. I love the Psalms. I have talked often about how comforting the Psalms are. Often, before you even lay your head on your pillow, one of the best ways to be encouraged is to go to the Psalms. I, I, I can tell you there's no doubt about that. But the Psalms also have a lot to say. Not only are the Psalms encouraging, and they truly are, and just a blessing. And just by the way, so are these verses that we just read. But you receive the whole counsel of God through the Psalms. You see in the Psalms a, a loving God, but a God of justice. Amen? A God of judgment. We don't hear that kind of language very often anymore. But that might be because we don't preach the whole counsel of God in too many cases anymore. And we're going to break this down just a little bit and consider how... Often in the Psalms, you may, be, you may be seeing a block of scripture that speaks to a, 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 a period of time in which it was written and also a future period which the Psalm may be speaking to. And in many cases, I believe there might be multiple uh, opportunities to see where the application might be. I can tell you this, keep it simple. And always read your Bible and say, Lord, speak to my heart Amen. about what you want me to see. And uh, we'll continue to study the word of God and we'll continue to, to look carefully at each and every verse. But there are some scripture right here that ought to just grab a hold of all of us tonight. Psalm 2 was written, I believe, as a, as a coronation of a new king of Israel. I also believe that that king was David. David, who is responsible for 90% of the Psalms. Already Israel was looking for the ideal king for the future. And we know who the ideal king for the future is. Jesus Christ, the Messiah. You know, we're only less than 30 days away from voting for the President of the United States of America. You know, that's a pretty important position. I, I'm willing to admit that. Probably less important than it used to be, I guess. But I can tell you there's a position that's way more important. And that is, who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Who deserves all praise and glory? Who ultimately is going to be the one who is recognized? He already is, holds this position. He is God. But he will be recognized in the future as Messiah, as really the Messiah, the Christ of God's kingdom. No doubt about it. And so we see some of this future language here. Now, don't break fellowship with me if there's one point that you might place at a different place. But get a hold of what the scripture says tonight. Let's notice, first of all, number one, humankind's rebellion. How far do you have to look in the scripture to find rebellion? How about Genesis? <laughs> we don't have to go very far at all, do we? Man, man, the demonstration of God's uh, long-suffering is continual through scripture, and man's re rebellion is obvious also. Look again at these first few verses. That's what I like to do is read and then read and then reread. That way, I don't know about you, but that helps me to get it a little bit better. Amen. Notice Psalm. Notice these first few verses again. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Now, that almost sounds like some of what's going on today in our geopolitical world in which we live in. Doesn't it sound like the world that we live in? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, 
saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. So we have all of the leadership of the world conspiring against God. You know what? (laughs) This may be a future time, but it sure sounds a whole lot like the world in which we live in today. It really does. You know, we have, uh, we're hearing things on the news about people who, uh, who are involved in political activity who say that, that being a, uh, a person of faith is, is a backward, you know, well, let me just, without going into specific language, let me just say there, there's no misunderstanding that in the world in which we live today, born-again Christians are not liked. (laughs) Is that okay to say? It really is true. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, listen, uh, this is in the Daryl Miller translation, they hate me. They're they're going to hate you too. (laughs) That's That's the way it is. And how many would say that I agree that today we... Maybe see it even more than you might think. The psalm portrayed people plotting a revolt against the king of Israel. The heathen rage. We're talking about wild commotion. The people imagine a vain thing. They're in conspiracy against God. You know what? When God's the ruler, it is a vain thing to imagine that you're going to take charge and and have any power to overthrow or control him. That's vain. You're wasting your time. Yet, they do. And that is still, in fact, the case today. The rebellion of the people against the new king was regarded as a revolt against the Lord because the king was... Ideally set apart as God's anointed leader. The rebels sought to break the bands uh, to divine, uh, uh, to, to restrain. We see this all through the scripture. And may I say that while we may be talking about a future time, I believe with all my heart we can look at all you have to do, you can read your Bible, and it's like reading, well, we used to say the front page of the newspaper, but since nobody reads a newspaper anymore, <laughs> it's, it's, what's, it's what your smartphone says, okay? It, it's like reading your tablet. And, you know, some of you can just cease from reading that while I'm preaching. Just wait till later. You can check on it, and it's all true. Amen? But... When we look at what's happening today and what we hear happening today, uh, we're reminded that, that this is the world in which we live in. But we also know that in a future sense, well, we know the timeline. First of all, what, must, what, what would be the next most important event in God's timeline regarding things of the future? The return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that it's imminent. We believe that it can happen even now before I finish preaching this message. We believe with all our heart that we, the church, believers, will be taken up out of here and we will be received in uh, in what we call the rapture. And we know then there will be a period of seven years called the tribulation but we also know how at the end of the tribulation we will return with the Lord and then the Lord will reign for 1,000 years and I believe much of the language that we see here probably speaks to that time as the author looks to looks forward to that time when you know what we won't have to worry about who the next president of the United States is going to be we won't have to worry about what might be taking place in any other way geopolitically because king jesus amen king jesus will reign for sure 
But you know, the warning, the clarion call for us today is to say, Jesus is coming. Do you know for sure if you die today where you would spend eternity? That's, that's our number one role. Our number one role is not politics, although I am the first one to tell you that I believe with all my heart that responsible Christians do not sit on the sideline and watch the world go by. They are responsible citizens who, who take full opportunity to vote the Bible. Vote the Bible. You say, well, how should I vote? What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about the sanctity of marriage? What does the Bible say about the sanctity of life? And I don't think it's that confusing. Some people are walking around saying, I'm not even going to participate. I just don't find anywhere in the scripture where that, in fact, is the case. It really isn't. First of all, we know for sure we're supposed to pray for our leaders. But you know what we also need to be doing while we're being responsible Christians is doing our first order of business, and that's telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Telling people about where the real answer is found. And so this really is a psalm of encouragement because, yes, it really is true. Jesus wins, okay? We've read the back of the book, and because we're with Jesus, we win. So quickly, notice number two, God's indignation. Now these are pretty, some, some pretty strong verses here, aren't they? God responds to the people who revolt against his rulers. The psalmist pictured God laughing. I mean, that's exactly what we see here. He's, he's laughing at these revolutionaries. Look at verse 4. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. That's pretty strong language. Now, someone might say, well, is that right? Is that appropriate? Let me just help you with this one. God can do what he wants to do, amen? You know what? I, I, I don't know why people would get all bent out of shape over this, but let me just make this clear as I possibly can. If we got what we deserve, none of us would be here. That's just the truth. And God's judgment, which is final, is also sovereign. He is God. Notice, we see, we see that this is, well, let me just put it this way. I think that this language also helps us to understand how, how futile and frivolous any, any type of, of, of rebellion against God is. Not only is it foolish and frivolous, and absolutely a waste of time for the enemy. But it's also foolish and frivolous and a waste of good energy and good time for the believer who has allowed himself to backslide into an area where he is not trusting God, not, not believing God. I mentioned that I was talking to someone today, and this precious one um, ha has gone through a loss in their family, and they have family members who are angry at God. Now, I listen, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you need to get saved. But I know people who claim to know Christ as their Savior, and, and somewhere, somehow, some way along the way, they've come to the conclusion that they're mad at God, and they're just really going to hold that line until God finally, I guess, says he's sorry. i, I, I got to tell you something. We've come up short in our discipleship if we haven't been able to explain to them that God is good and what he does is good. And it's Satan that would cause you to believe that being angry at God is your best choice or your best answer. Now, I guess one of the reasons why I have, haven't really ever had a big problem with getting angry at God 
is because I'm such a low-down piece of nothing that I'm still overwhelmed at the idea that Jesus would love me enough to save my soul. I, I'm still not over that one yet. I, I mean, I have way more than I ever would hope for or deserve in any way whatsoever. That's just the truth. And so, I don't know, maybe there's a whole bunch of us who have, who have done so much better and have been so much more deserving. Maybe I'm just part of that crowd who recognizes that I don't deserve anything. I, I really don't. I don't deserve anything. I sure don't deserve to be uh, privileged to, to be able to be used of God in any way. I, 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 don't have, uh, I, I don't have any real reason why I deserve that. And so I'm just one of these who says, yeah, there are things that have happened that I don't always understand. There are things that don't make a lot of sense to me. But I'll tell you what. I just made up my mind a long time ago that being angry at God, and that would be the Christian's rebellion against God, is a bad plan. And it's not, it's, it's, from, it's from the enemy, no doubt about it. But you know what? It also encourages you and I tonight to know that while it sometimes seems like the enemy's winning, here's the truth, are you ready? <laughs> He's not going to win. He's not going to win. You know, you can even see the loss of a battle or two, seemingly, but that doesn't mean that this war is over, and I'm here to tell you that no matter what happens, should the Lord tarry, even in the next month or so, no matter what happens, God is still on the throne and in control. He wins. You say, well, who's going to win? I'll tell you who's going to win. King Jesus is going to win. That's who's going to win. And we need to keep our eyes on him. And we need to, we need to look around and, and, and remember that things have been much worse than this at different times. In, in modern history, where people saw their, their governments overthrown and, and basically the kinds of things that, that made them think that they were actually in the tribulation. But the real truth is, Jesus wins. He does. And so, our God has every right and authority, and he has the power uh, to speak his displeasure against them. In a way, the language is used that he's laughing because it just shows you how great God is and how little we are. You know, it's almost like, you know, uh, a little ant, you know, climbing in Jaime Reyes's bug truck over there thinking that he's going to eat the truck. You know, it's not going to happen. It's, it's that big of a vast difference between the two. One of the worst realities of life is to have God against you. You know, if you want to talk about a real, real scary scenario, consider that. You know, after it's all said and done, I want to be on the Lord's side. That's just all there is to it. I want to be on the Lord's side. Look, at, look again at verse 5 and 6. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. I do not want God's wrath and his sore displeasure vexed on me. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And so here we see that you don't want God against you. And then I know we need to move quickly here. Notice, thirdly, God's decree. God's decree. In the day of coronation, the king was acknowledged as God's son. Hmm, let me think. I need some homiletical vivisectionists to help me with this. Who might that be? Look at verse 7. And I will decree, and, and I will declare the decree, the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. I don't know, it sounds to me exactly like who we know this is. God acknowledged Jesus Christ as the ideal ruler, 
Mark chapter 1, verse 11 says, Thou art my beloved son. Amen? The vision of the world domination of the ruler in verse 8 goes beyond David's reign. Evidently, the psalmist looked toward the Messiah as the ideal ruler. And you know what? I, I, I hope this is an encouragement to you tonight. Because your Jesus, King Jesus, the Messiah is the ideal ruler. And the Messiah will rule by conquest. If you want a better picture of who the Christ of this period will be, spend time reading Revelation. You know, many people have this really distorted Hollywood 1960s movie uh, idea of Jesus Christ as some, you know, frail-looking thin man. And I'm here to tell you, you don't know the Jesus of the Bible, my friend. We, we are thankful that Jesus loves us so much that he died for us that we, because he loves us so much that he has made a way for us, will spend eternity with him. But I'm going to tell you something. This same loving Jesus is a Jesus of judgment and a Jesus who has every right and authority to rule by conquest. Ultimately, all the world will be under the domination of Jesus. That's the truth. Uh, this does not mean that, that all ultimately will be saved. Instead, it means that God's Messiah, Jesus, will rule universally. We don't have time to break all of this down, but we see this. Uh, we're, we're just having an opportunity to glimpse into this as we look at this psalm. Look at verse 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. That's pretty strong language. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. This is the one who's spoken of in verse 7. My son. And so then finally notice with me. Humankind's admonishment. Both rulers and subjects were enjoined to submit to the Lord. Notice the admonishments. Be wise. Be instructed. Serve the Lord. Rejoice with trembling. By the way, listen, born again Christian, that ought to be the case for you and I. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun. What a verse that is. I mean, what a, what a great verse. Kiss the sun. That, that's S-O-N. People who submit to the Lord find a security and happiness in life like no other. Now we can talk about exactly where all of this falls into the place for everyone in the future, but I can make it simple, which works for me, by the way. Keep it simple. Either you're with him or you're not. How about that? Either... He's your savior or he's not. And I just believe with all my heart that the very best time to make a decision about where you stand with Jesus is right now, right now, right now. And you should, you should be wise. You should take instruction. You should serve the Lord now and then be able to rejoice be able to rejoice. And yes, kiss the sun. You know, you think about how many hundreds of years ago these, these passages were penned, these songs were sung, and yet here we are today looking at what we see happening in the world today and recognizing that Jesus is truly the answer. You know, in a world in which everybody else is looking for answers, 
We have the answer right here. We have the truth. Just as the message of Psalm 2 was vital to Israel in the time of the kings, so it is vital to you and I, to America today. If, if we want um, our country to prosper, vote the Bible, vote the right way. But what will cause prosperity will be when this country turns back to the Lord. We need to be the ones who lead the way. We need to be the ones who submit to the leadership of the Lord and let people see that this, in fact, is the real answer. And I got to tell you something. I still get excited when I see every once in a while people who are actually in leadership who, without apology, are able to say that I have trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I was happy to hear one individual say, who could quite possibly be a heartbeat away from the president, see, someday, I am a Christian first, a conservative second, and a Republican third. I'm here to tell you, every single one of us want to be able to say, I'm a Christian first. I'm a Christian first. Amen? This is an encouraging psalm. This is not a psalm for us to go running around and talking about you know, how God's going to, you know, beat up on the bad guy. This is, a, this, is a, this is a psalm that allows for those who would be foolish enough to come against the Lord to wake up, to wake up and know that that is a, that is a, that is a fight you're not going to win. And for any of us, even in this room, if there's someone in this room who, who hasn't, made the most important decision of their life, hasn't trusted Jesus Christ. Listen, my friend, what we're reading in this psalm, this little glimpse into not only the future, but into the here and now, you want to say yes to King Jesus. You want to ask him into your heart to be your Savior. Amen? Well, amen. Father, we do thank you for tonight's study. I know that we would not be able to exhaust all the truth that is found here in, in these 12 verses. But, Lord, even as you have spoken to us, Holy Spirit, I pray that we're encouraged and thankful that we are on the winning side. We're on the Lord's side. And that's exactly where we know we need to be. But we need to be able to stand with the boldness and authority in a right spirit that comes with being a born-again Christian. And with all the crazy things that are happening today, I think some of us just needed to be encouraged tonight that, that we can fully have confidence in and trust in our Savior and, and have your way with us tonight and remind us of that, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.